So this is now episode number 16, and we are moving through with this title, Mahmud, Mahmud, Mahmud. We've seen it start with the Ugarites. We know that it's right through the Old Testament. Uh, we know that it's, it's Ambrose in the fourth century who actually uh, refers to the Mahmud, the Old Testament Mahmud, the Messiah, and the Messiah who's to come, which uh, who to come again the second time uh, for, for the Christians would be Jesus Christ. And the seventh century, Mahmud is well known within Christian circles as Jesus, the return of Jesus. That makes, makes sense and why it's on that coin that, that Mu'awiyah puts on, Mahmud there with the crosses on the other side of the coin famous coin now that makes sense but we haven't really looked much at the jewish side of it because the jews also use this term this praised one and the jews used it for their exilarchs now what mel you're going to do what you're going to do you're going to um help us walk through and show that we've already gone through the succession of the exilarchs you're going to show that these exilarchs were also seen as messiahs and they which would be uh, therefore that's why they would be referring to them as mahmuds so over to you help us with this show us what you're talking about and uh, we'll go from we'll go from there okay let me just i'll go straight into sharing the slides in a second now. all right so i suppose the key, the key thing today is just to confirm that jewish people did actually believe that their exilarchs were messiahs this is the cru crucial piece of the jigsaw. It's one thing to suppose that that's what was going on, but it's another thing to prove it. And so we do have actually direct evidence from Jewish writings of that very thing. Let's see. So if we think back, um, earlier we saw it was claimed that Marzutra's successors, Marzutra being the ex lark that was killed by the Persians back in the early part of the 6th century, we said that his successors were the progenitors of the chain of Muhammad. So the key people being Nehemiah bin Huziel and his brother Salman, which are shown there on the, the picture. AJ Juice proposes that the so-called Rashidun, the rightly guided, are in fact Jewish leaders, simply renamed, given different biographies. Mm -hmm. So the key piece of evidence and source for this evidence is a book by David C. Mitchell called Messiah Ben Joseph. And he's done an amazing bit of research over the last 20 or 30 years on an area that isn't really widely known outside of Jewish circles. And um, what he suggests that according to Jewish eschatology, before Messiah Ben David comes, there would first be a Messiah Ben Joseph who would gather the Jews in Israel but who would be a suffering servant who would be ultimately killed and by doing so atone for Israel. He is sometimes referred to as the shepherd rock and the rock that the builders rejected. Now, Christians are kind of familiar with these two separate concepts in terms of Jesus. We're all familiar with Jesus as a suffering servant and also as the returning Messiah at the end of time. But for Jews, they consider these as two separate individuals, which is you know a bit strange for us as Christians to think of it that way. So Jews would be expecting first the Messiah being Joseph to come along who would be killed and the later they would be expecting Messiah being David to come along. Okay, so that's that's the idea. Okay. So if we look at Surah 61.6 here, we can see this messianic pair in action. Now the Quran has got it all a bit confused. It's presents Jesus as the Messiah four times, or the Mahmed, and then it refers to another one to come after him. So if we see there, it says, uh, I mentioned when Jesus, the son of Mary, said, O children of Israel, indeed I am the messenger of Allah to you, confirming what came before me of the Torah and bringing good tidings of a messenger to come after me, whose name is Ahmed. So Ahmed is just another word for Messiah, another word for Mahmed. Um, and so we can see that this passage here has been influenced by that concept in Judaism of the messianic pair. So if Jesus, if for, from the perspective of the Quran, is the the Messiah bin Joseph, then they expect a Messiah bin David. So Ahmed is the equivalent of the Messiah bin David. All right. 
Now, we've got four different Jewish sources that refer to the belief that some exilarchs um, were the Messiah for them in the seventh century. Um, and these are very early writings. They're actually written um, in the early part of the seventh century. So the first one we're going to look at is the Midrash Otot HaMashia, or the Signs of the Messiah. Uh, we don't have the exact uh, year it was written, but it was sometime between 617 AD, and which was the year of Ben Hushiel's death, and 638, the year of the Arab conquest of Jerusalem. So the key line for us is it says, Messiah bin Joseph will appear and his name is Nehemiah bin Huziel. And the rest doesn't really concern us. The key thing is they're identifying their exilarch, Nehemiah bin, jo uh, bin Huziel, as the Messiah bin Joseph, the first of the two messiahs. So that's a hugely important piece of evidence. We also have the second one, uh, Esherat Otot, Idrash of the Ten Signs. Similar uh, dating, 617 to 634 AD. It says, in the sixth sign, it says, the Holy One, blessed be he, will produce at that time Messiah bin Joseph, whose name is Nehemiah bin Huziel. Now, it's written after the death of um, Nehemiah bin Huziel, but it's it's obviously presenting itself as if it's a prophecy of what will happen. Okay. The third one is Perke Hekalot Rabati, or the Great Palaces. Sections 38 to 40 is the key bit that we need. It's a messianic apocalypse. The text suggests that the Messiah bin David would appear around the year 654, which is during the reign of Exilarch Bostonay. So the they're, they're writing it long before that period, but they're, they're guessing that that's when the second Messiah would come. So it says 40 years before Messiah bin David comes, whose name is Menahim bin Amiel, will come Nehemiah bin Hujil, a man of Ephraim bin Joseph, and he will stand forth in Jerusalem and cause all Israel to gather to him there. So that's our third reference to Nehemiah bin Hujil being a Messiah. Uh, Nehemiah ben Huziel became governor of Jerusalem in 614, so therefore this writer expects Messiah ben David to appear in 654 AD. And then uh, if we look at this here, we can see that Bostone was the exilarch from 642 to 665, so that would place him as that um, mess Messiah ben David. So you can imagine that Jews that were waiting for this Messiah, Ben David, they would probably treat uh, Boston A as the Messiah because his reign falls exactly in the middle of this time frame. And then finally, we have the book of Zerubbabel. Um, David C. Mitchell tells us that the, the book was an important and influential work and was known in all the main centers of medieval Judaism. Several complete manuscripts of it and fragments survive. So who is Zerubbabel that this book refers to? Um, he is the second exilarch who built the second temple around 516 BC, following the return of the Jews from the Babylonian exile. It was later enlarged and renovated by the Hasmoneans and Herod the Great. I don't know if you want to jump in at this stage, Jay, or shall I go on? Just, I'm a little confused here. Why are you now jumping back to 516 BC if we're in, we're in we're going through 615, 614? Why are you jumping back suddenly? So in this apocalypse, what they're doing is they are putting a prophecy in the mouth of someone from the Old Testament. They're writing in the 7th century, and they're saying that this um, person from the Old Testament times uh, is prophesying the Messiah in their century. That's okay. what they're doing. That's why it's kind of it's a type of uh, literary device that they use to kind of add gravitas to their writings, you know. So it's from our perspective, we'd say, well, this is um, this is false. This is fiction. But, you know, there's a bit of poetic license here. They're, they're, that's the way they're 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 um, they're painting the, the their current times. OK. So that's who Zerubbabel is. What is this book? 
The Midrash takes the form of a prophetic vision revealed to the biblical figure Zerubbabel ben Shealtiel, the second Babylonian exarch, who in rabbinic thought is the same person as biblical Nehemiah, the governor of Jerusalem. There's obviously a parallel being seen between that Nehemiah from the Old Testament and the Nehemiah bin Huziel from the 7th century. And that's why they're using that guy as a as the person that's prophesying about the, the, the newer Nehemiah, who's the governor of Jerusalem from 614 to 617. So since this biblical exilarch was the ancestor of the exilarch governor Nehemiah bin Huziel, the meaning of the work becomes clear. The writer wishes his contemporaries to believe that the one who built the second temple or saw his descendants, the sons of Hushiel, building the third temple. That's the whole point. They're trying to say that the sons of Nehemiah bin Huziel are going to build the third temple. So you can imagine there's so much excitement now. Um, the Messiah has arrived. They're going to now rebuild the temple. And of course, we know from our sources that one of the things that the Jews did when they conquered Jerusalem is to go to the Temple Mount and they start looking to see could they build the um, the temple again. Of course, then what happens is Umar comes along and he, he kicks them off the mount and, and they start building um, um, some form of building for the Arabs to pray on instead. So that's that's the background to it. So this book was, again, like the other three, was written in the mid-30s. Uh, Mitchell says that the statement that Israel's salvation will come after 990 years from the founding of the Second Temple suggests that the author hoped for deliverance around 638 AD. Okay, so that's all I can say is that's Mitchell's estimation based on his reading of the text. Uh, since he predicts that Armelus, that is Heraclius, will reign for seven years and hopes for deliverance thereafter, it's likely that he is writing in the mid-630. So this is before uh, Umar has come into Jerusalem to conquer it. They're already expecting the deliverance in 638. That's the key year. That's probably what pushed them all on to reconquer Jerusalem in, in the late 630s as well. Okay. So... The book identifies Nehemiah and seems to suggest his brother Shalom are the messiahs. So it's definite about Messiah bin Joseph. And they are hinting that Messiah bin David is actually his brother Shalom. Okay. Now it's interesting from this paper that this diagram comes from. Um, the, the Jewish writer proposes that um, Shalom or they the brother of Nehemiah is actually the same person as Salman Farsi, who, of course, shows up in the standard Islamic narrative as the companion of Muhammad. Why is he the comp companion of Muhammad, you might ask? Well, it kind of makes sense if you have a double Messiah. One of them is Messiah bin Joseph, that's Nehemiah. Then the other Messiah is, is um, Shalom. So that's where it starts. It starts in the Jewish uh, mythology about these exilarchs. And then it morphs over time to become the first Messiah is now Muhammad. And the second one becomes his companion, who's called Salman al-Farsi. So that's the idea behind it. Um, a little bit more from the text. It says, and he said to me, Messiah bin Joseph, that's Nehemiah, uh, will gather all Israel as one man, and they will remain four years in Jerusalem and will offer sacrifices. He obviously gets killed after four years. That would match up with Nehemiah 614 to 617. It goes on to say, all the nations of the world will encamp behind this evil Satan, Armelus, who's considered to be Heraclius, except Israel. All Israel will mourn Nehemiah bin Huziel, who was slain. His corpse will be thrown before the gate of Jerusalem, but the beasts and the birds will not touch it. Um, it introduces the expectation of Messiah bin David. And he said to me, Menahim bin Amiel will come suddenly in the month of Nisan and stand on the valley of Arbel and all the sages of Israel will go out to him. And bin Amiel will say to them, I am the Messiah whom the Lord sent to announce good news to you and to save you from the hand of your enemies. The conclusion that really is, the four separate Jewish writings confirm A.J. Juice's ideas that there was a belief 
in a chain of Messiahs or Mahmuds in the seventh century. And in summary, these four separate Jewish writings confirm A.J. Juice's ideas about this chain of Mahmuds or Mahmuds in the seventh century. Nehemiah bin Huzil was the first. He was killed in 617. We can only imagine the Jewish reaction to that event. Probably what happened was after Shalom was a bit of a, a damp squid, didn't really conquer everything, they had to reinvent the mythology. Or maybe the next person is the Messiah. Maybe the next person. And then it became a chain of people who they thought, oh, maybe this is the Messiah. And that's why we have the Chinese source that talks about a whole chain of these Moshu or Messiahs. So I'm going to hand it back to you, Jay. Okay, so remember, just so we're all in on the same page, we're trying to trace where these Mahmuds are, these titles of Messiah. Mahmud is the Messiah. Mahmud is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. But from the Christian perspective, we're now moving over to the Jewish perspective. And from the Jewish perspective, there is a lot of information. <clears throat> no one's looked at it before. That's why A.J. Dius is so important. Mel is taking from A.J. Dius. And we have this, this David Mitchell fellow who is coming up and actually in, unpacking it for us. I don't think David Mitchell knew what we're looking for. He didn't realize the liaisons, but the dates really do fit. That's why this is exciting. When you look at, see what's happening in the 7th century. See, remember, we're in the 7th century. We've asked for evidence from the 7th century. You've got to see what the Jews are doing there as well. Now, just to be fair, Mel, these Jews are all in what is today Iraq. Am I correct? They're all over the place. They're, they're a diaspora. So do you have some Jews in Israel, some are in Iraq. They're in northern um, uh, Africa Where are the well. exilarchs? Where are the exilarchs? Where are they um the Exarchs are, are in what we would call Baghdad today. So that's Iraq. So remember, we're in the right area. We're in the place where Arabic is used. We're in the place where the word Muhammad would be used as the praise one. And so these Eklarts are taking on this title themselves in a Jewish context because they believe that this is the Messiah they're waiting for. And remember, uh, this Messiah, the Jews are still waiting for. It. They don't believe he has yet to come, but they really are hoping for him. And so when you go back to what Mitchell has done, David Mitchell has gone back to look and he sees that there are really two messiahs that are coming. Am I correct, Mel? One would be the suffering servant messiah and the other one would be the victorious messiah. Yeah, the, the first one would be referred to as Messiah bin uh, Joseph. The second one is called Messiah bin David. So two messiahs. We see that uh, from, from Isaiah, the whole Isaiah account of chapter 53, as all encompassing being part of what Jesus did. He came to suffer, and of course, he will come again as a vic in a victory yet to come in the second coming. But the Jews do it as two completely different individuals coming separate from each other. Now, what Mitchell has done and what A.J. Dewis has picked up and what you're going with is that you can follow these through. You can follow that they thought this was happening in the 7th century. And you can see this with this uh nehemiah ben hushel who they believe was the ben joseph the first one the suffering one and that his brother then would be uh shalom who would be the one that would be the ben david the one the second messiah and to back that up you went back to zerubbabel way back in the five five hundred bc where this is this is uh referred to that the second temple built by him, there will be a third temple built by this Messiah that is going to come. All the Jews in the seventh century thought, this is it, this is it, it must be this guy, because he would be the suffering servant, his brother would be the victorious one. As you said, that didn't happen. Uh, Shalom looked like a damp squid. And so as a result of that, they had to keep naming others, others and others who come after. And so that's why you're still, the hope is there, the hope is there that the one that will come finally will be the Messiah who will then destroy the enemies and bring back the, the third kingdom or the uh, the third temple. So I'm assuming now, is there anything you want to add to that? Because that, I think people, are, people have been wondering, why are we looking so much at the Jewish side? Because the Jews are very much also part and parcel of what's happening, what then the Arabs then take. They are taking this Messiah since both the Christians and the Jews are looking for the Messiah, one a second time, the, the other the first time. The Arabs naturally want to then be part of the party. They want to be also yeah. part of it. That's why they they want to say, we've got the Muhammad. We've got the final one. 
And by the 8th and 9th century, they assume and they put it back to this guy, but they don't put him up in Baghdad. They don't put him in Jerusalem for obvious reason, because that's the Jews and the Christians have too much history there. They want their own group of prophet from the Ishmaelite clan, not from Isaac. They want their own prophet, who is the greatest, the final, the one who brings the final revelation, who will then bring that which corrects that which has gone before. So they put him into Mecca down in the 8th century in a completely different place. You can imagine when the Jews are going around saying, we've got the Messiah bin Joseph now, and we've got the Messiah bin David. You can see that in the 660s, when they start putting Mahmoud on the coins, the Christians are snubbing their nose and saying, no, 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 the Messiah is Jesus, because they put the cross, like not just once, maybe three times on the coins with Mahmoud. So they're basically saying, no, 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 we own the Mahmoud, we have the, Ma we have the Messiah, not you. You can you can see that there's an argument there between the Jews and the Christians. That's there the argument. debate going on right there. Isn't that fast? Right there. Because yeah. look and see who who minted that coin. Uh, that that is Muawiya. He's in Damascus. The Jews are in Baghdad. There's all this rivalry between uh, or Stesiphon at that time it wasn't called Baghdad then. So you have this rivalry going on between those in Iraq and those in Dama uh, in Syria, and the Christians are in Syria, they have the real Mahmud. Now it makes sense why they put not one, not two, but three different crosses on the front side. And look at the back side, I'm gonna put it right here, and then a cross above the M, and there's the Mahmud below. We've got the Mahmud. This, now we're starting to see, this is a rivalry that's going on between the yeah. Christians and the Jews. It also makes sense why Muawiyah would put a cross at the beginning of inscriptions as well. So he wasn't just go. on the coins. It all makes sense now. We can see now why when it describes Muawiyah going to Jerusalem, he goes to pray in Golgotha. He goes visit all the important places for Christians. That would make no sense if he was a Muslim. Absolutely. It makes more sense now. You know? And he never goes to Mecca. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. yeah. In one place, if he was a Muslim, he should go. He goes to Jerusalem. He's a good Christian because he knows that that's where the pilgrimages are. That's where all the Christians went, and the Jews do as well, but not any Muslim. Muslims do not go to Jerusalem for their pilgrimage. This is all great stuff. Now, next, what we were going to do, I think in the next episode, we're going to look at the whole thing with the Hijrah. What and where did that come from? And where did the dates go wrong? And what exactly, how did that come about? And then after that, we're going to summarize everything. We're going to put it all together so you can all make sense of it. Because I'm hearing a lot of people are saying, too much information again. Mel's throwing and pouring. He's like a he's like a spit or he's like a water hydrant. He's just pulling out all this stuff that's going all over the place. How do we make sense of it, folks? We're going to do that yeah, in the, 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 this is number 16, so that will probably be number 18. So hold on. We are going to get there. We're going to make sense of it all so that you can use this. God bless you, Mel. Thanks so much for doing that. And also uh, for those who have helped you like A.J. Dios and the others. It's so great. Now this David Mitchell who's come on board as well. I wonder if I'm related to him because I'm from the Mitchell clan as well. Anyways, until next time, this is Mel and Jay, thousands of miles apart, coming to you. Put in your comments. Over and out. Yeah.